Well, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. For okay. once, we're starting uh, in the afternoon, and uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, my name is Max Kovalov. Welcome to the World Affairs Colloquium Series. I'm the director of the Moroz Global Leadership Institute. The mission of the Moroz Global Leadership Institute is uh, to help our students acquire the skills of global fluency and educate them about diplomacy, and uh, more specifically about uh, track two diplomacy, the back channel diplomacy. Uh, we run a number of programs, and this World Affairs Colloquium series uh, is an important part of our programming because it's designed to bring to campus remotely and in person uh, people with uh, prominent international experience uh, to stimulate discussions and conversations with members uh, of our, or with our students, faculty, and members of our community. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, we have a number of uh, guests uh, connecting to us remotely. We have uh, our face-to-face -face audience. We will start with uh, a couple of uh, in introductory remarks by uh, our guests, uh, uh, and then we will move to a discussion about human rights. And we're very fortunate to have uh, two uh, very unique guests uh, with us tonight and very well positioned to talk about human rights. Uh, Jonathan Fenton, uh, Dr. Fenton is uh, served as a president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences from 2014 to 2019 and has been a special advisor to the World Refugee and Migration Council since its launch in 2017. Uh, his previous experience also includes serving as interim director of the Roosevelt uh, House Public Policy Institute uh, at Hunter College from 2009 to 2014. And between 1999 uh, and 2009, uh, Dr. Fenton was president of the John and Catherine MacArthur Foundation. Uh, for 17 years, uh, he was also the president of the New School of Social Research. Uh, he also served as vice president of planning at the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, Dr. Fenton serves uh, on the board uh, of many uh, international organizations, service organizations, including Human Rights Watch, the Security Council Report, New York uh, State Commission on Independent Colleges and Universities, and uh, uh, he also is on the board of the Integrity Initiatives in International, European Humanities University and American University of Afghanistan and the American Exchange Project. Uh, with this, I give the floor to Dr. Fenton and then he will introduce our remote speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Max, for that generous uh, introduction. So let me welcome Ken Roth. Uh, you have a big uh, image of yourself here, uh, Ken. Uh, former director of Human Rights Watch, who is joining us from Geneva. In a moment, uh, Ken will make some opening remarks and he and I will have a conversation and then we'll open the floor to you and to hear your questions and comments. Human Rights Watch was founded in 1978 as Helsinki Watch to investigate human rights violations in countries that signed the Helsinki Accords. It soon expanded beyond Europe to South America, and then in the 80s and 90s, became a global organization working in over 100 countries. I joined HRW in 1983, so pretty close to the beginning, and later became chair of the Europe and Central Asia Committee, and then in the late 90s, chair of the board worldwide. In 1993, I led the search for an executive director to replace the founder, Arian Iyer. Well, that's always a great challenge, replacing a founder. Well, we chose Ken Roth, uh, who had joined HRW in 1987. And I want to say it is the very best decision I've ever been part of. And I mean that, Ken. Ken graduated from Brown and then Yale Law School. For HEW, he served as assistant uh, U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York and was part of the team investigating the Iran-Contra affair. Under his 30-year leadership, the HRW staff grew from under 50 to over 500, and the geographical uh, range became truly worldwide. He also moved the organization beyond its focus on political rights to include economic and social rights. Issues like women's rights, children's rights, access to health care, equality, and more now have staff focused on them. As Ken once said, and I quote, 
Together, we can use our influence from advocating with world leaders to sharing the truth of what's happening on the ground to help stop repression around the world. Very, very good quote. HRW is the most effective human rights organization in the world, if I may say so. It earned a share of the Nobel Peace Prize for helping secure the ban on anti-personnel mines. It was a key advocate for the International Criminal Court and other instruments of international justice. But Ken is not just a managerial leader. Yes, he's a good fundraiser, hires outstanding staff, has built a strong board. But he's mainly the intellectual leader of HRW and an effective advocate of its positions, speaking truth to power. And he's also a compelling author of articles, op-ed commentaries, and more. A recent sample shows his breadth, building the war crimes case against Vladimir Putin in the Globe and Mail, Ethiopia's invisible cleansing in foreign affairs. Beyond Russia, the real threat to human rights is from China. How Biden should engage with the UN Human Rights Council. How can democracy defeat autocracy? And that's, believe me, just a small sample, but it should encourage you uh, in the question period to raise any topic you want. And I guarantee Ken has thought about it. So Ken, now let me turn to you uh, to tell us more about issues that are top of mind. And when you're done, I'll come back and uh, ask you a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to the group. Over to you, Ken. All right, well, thank you very much, Jonathan. I, I should just say that, um, you know, you and I have had a fantastic partnership going back at this point, literally decades. And, um, you know, Jonathan, you played a central role in making it possible to build Human Rights Watch into what it is today. And at certain key transitional moments, um, you were there as, as a real leader. Um, so I, I'm completely grateful to you. And I, I just wanna say what a pleasure it is for me to join you. I'm sorry I forced everybody to come earlier than usual, but I think evening for you would have been like the middle of the night for me. So we're kind of compromising midway at this stage, but it's, it's my pleasure to be able to join you. Um, I thought that what I would do tonight is to address one of the topics that Jonathan just mentioned in, in that list of articles. And that is the global contest today that we're really very much in the middle of between autocracy and democracy. And I chose this topic because I think there is a common wisdom out there that says, oh, you know, autocracy is ascendant, democracy is in decline. And there's kind of this defeatist attitude that, you know, the autocrats are really kind of where the world is going right now. And I think that that common wisdom is wrong. And I want to explain why in my opening remarks note some of the challenges ahead, but then you know, very much open it up for, for your questions and your comments on, on this or a range of other issues, as Jonathan noted. Now, you know, we have actually had a couple of very vivid illustrations of how autocracy can go wrong just in the last few months. Um, and it shouldn't be surprising because if you think, you know, who is an autocrat, you know, they tend to be people who surround themselves with sycophants and yes men, they suppress dissent, they don't like public debate about their decisions, they just want to give orders. And that is a recipe for bad decisions. So, you know, a good illustration is Vladimir Putin. Here he was, you know, a year ago, sitting in his echo chamber of one, at that point is, you know, COVID-induced isolation, you know, reading histories about Russia's glorious past, he decided that there was no such thing as Ukraine and that the Russian military could quickly prevail. And so, you know, without any debate, without really telling anybody, he ordered the invasion of Ukraine. And, you know, it, we all know it's been an utter disaster. Um, you know, I, there have obviously been many, many civilians who have died because Putin's strategy in Ukraine, much like his strategy previously in Syria or Chechnya, has been a war crime strategy. He attacks civilians. That's how he fights these wars. Um, but we've also seen a sort of a callousness with respect to Russian soldiers themselves, because, you know, once it became clear that he didn't have 
the military sophistication and the traditional means to prevail in Ukraine, he's began just throwing human waves of soldiers into the fight. And they've been, you know, slaughtered. Um, they really are being treated like cannon fodder. We don't know how many, but there clearly have been tens of thousands of just, you know, young Russian men who've been killed. And so, you know, this is the kind of disastrous situation that one gets when you have an autocrat who doesn't allow debate about his decisions. Now, another very vivid example of this is Xi Jinping in China. And we've had, you know, kind of various decisions that he has made. He just, you know, got um, selected for his third term, you know, breaking the Chinese tradition of having only two terms. He essentially is trying to get himself coronated emperor for life. But again, no dissent allowed, no public debate. Um, the, the group of people who even get to make decisions is smaller and smaller. They're all of his people, you know, no real dissent allowed, even within the higher echelons of government. And so what do you get? You got his, you know, endless zero COVID lockdowns, which, you know, clearly were not sustainable. They were an economic disaster for the Chinese people. Um, people were arbitrarily being locked up for weeks on end, you know, often without adequate care for their food, for their, you know, their ability to even get medical care if they needed it. And then because there were a bunch of protests, he suddenly did this about face. And without any of the preparation that, you know, debate would have insisted upon. So there was no serious effort to vaccinate older people, you know, many of whom are now very vulnerable to serious illness and death. Um, he refused to allow in the more effective Western mRNA vaccines because that would have been a blow to his, a blow to his nationalist pride. And so he's been, you know, insisting on going forward with the inferior Chinese vaccines. Um, he didn't, you know, spend money on building intensive care units, which are in desperately short supply in China, as so many older people, you know, need that extra care to avoid death from COVID. And so this is the kind of thing that happens, you know, when you have unchecked autocrats making decisions like this. And it's not just around COVID. You know, Xi Jinping has been attacking the most vibrant sectors of the Chinese economy because he sees them as a political threat. You know, people like Jack Ma were getting too powerful. And so he'd rather, you know, just, you know, decimate large sectors of the Chinese economy rather than face people who might challenge his monopoly on power. And this is not even speaking about, say, what he's done with the Uyghurs, where he's locked up, you know, a million Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims, essentially to force them through, through you know, forced indoctrination to abandon their religion, their culture, and their language. So this is what you get when you have autocracy. Now, it used to be that autocrats around the world, and, and you know, here it could be um, you know, Erdogan in, in, in Turkey, it could be Orban in, in Hungary, you know, even Putin um, until quite recently. They thought that they could cling to power by allowing kind of a degree of, of popular debate. So they would have what they would call managed elections. That is, you know, there would be a balloting event, but the playing field was tilted. So the media would be censored or, you know, public demonstrations would be curtailed or leading political parties would be stopped, you know, disbanded. Um, just enough so that the autocrat knew that he would win. And these were... Um, these managed elections, you know, people saw that they were not genuine, they were not free and fair, but they had enough semblance of reality that they did confer a degree of legitimacy. They were allowed the autocrat to say, I'm the popular choice. These days, you know, given how increasingly people see the disaster of autocratic rule, they're not even risking these sorts of managed elections. They are just holding electoral charades where all the opposition is imprisoned, um, where there is no political debate allowed, where the press is completely censored. And this is what we've seen recently in, in Russia, in Belarus, in, in Nicaragua. Um, this has become the preferred mode of, of holding elections. But these zombie elections confer no legitimacy whatsoever. Everybody sees through them as being complete charades. And so they actually, and they look like the strong man being strong, but they, um, are a desperate effort to cling to power without even having 
the, the facade of legitimacy that a slightly more open election would provide. Then, you know, to top things off, these autocrats increasingly are facing popular revolts and, and people who are just fed up with autocracy and they want some kind of accountable government. They want some kind of democratic rule. And so if you look at just in the last couple of years, you've had massive demonstrations, you know, in Iran, in Sudan, in Uganda, in Hong Kong, Myanmar, Russia, Belarus, Cuba, Nicaragua. I mean, almost every continent you look at, there's been this mass outpouring of popular opposition to autocracy, um, popular pressure for democracy. Um, these, you know, these protests often don't work because the protesters don't have the weapons, the, the, the autocrat has the weapons. So sometimes they do get rid of the autocrat. This happened with um, the Rajapaksas in Sri Lanka. They, they're gone. Um, this happened in a, you know, kind of more democratically free situation in Brazil where Bolsonaro is gone. Um, you know, Erdogan could easily lose the election coming up later this year. Um, Orban hung on by the, by the skin of his teeth. But, but more often, um, there are these zombie elections, and there just is brute force that keeps, you know, a Lukashenko in power in Belarus, or a Putin in power in Russia, or a Xi Jinping clinging to power in, in, in Hong Kong. And so, you know, what this, um, it really adds up to what I think is not a sustainable situation, because autocrats um, can't rule simply by fear. They need a degree of popular acquiescence in their rule. And if they don't trust the people at all, even have a managed election, they're in trouble. This is not a long-term solution. And, you know, just to give one example, I mean, Xi Jinping likes to say, oh, you know, the Chinese people have embraced this trade-off. You know, they let the Chinese Communist Party rule in return for which we give them economic growth. But then there was Hong Kong where you know, the one part of mainland controlled China where people had any say in the matter was Hong Kong. And they took to the streets by the hundreds of thousands to say they wanted nothing to do with the dictatorship of the Chinese Communist Party. And this was you know, such a blow to the legitimacy of Xi Jinping that he ripped up the one country, two um, systems agreement and, and imposed his dictatorship on Hong Kong. That's sort of what you're left with now, just pure force as a way of clinging to power. And it's it's one that, you know, without the legitimacy of any kind of popular consent is not a, as I say, it's not a good long-term solution. Now, I wanted to note that one thing that, you know, both Putin and Xi Jinping have done is to try to attack the international human rights system that would hold them to account for their repression. Um, and as I, you know, I think many of you know, the United Nations, you know, has a machinery that is designed to um, document human rights violations and generate pressure for change. And both Putin and Xi Jinping have tried to undermine this system. Putin does it really in, in two ways, neither of which is terribly successful. You know, one is his almost nihilistic approach to facts. You know, if, and if you look at you know, something like RT, the Russian television station, or Sputnik, the, the news agency, or just look at, you know, Kremlin propaganda. They treat facts as completely subjective, as unknowable. They lie through their teeth. They, they challenge, you know, any assertion. And they try to create this situation where, you know, it's impossible ever to know. There's always another side to the story. And that, um, it's not super convincing, but it gives um, those who don't want to vote against Russia, you know, particularly in parts of the, um, the global South, it gives them an excuse not to have to stand up to Russian atrocities, say war crimes in Ukraine. Um, and, and because the human rights movement is really dependent on facts to generate the shaming pressure that we use, um, this effort to undermine facts, you know, does do some harm. Putin is also a master at what's known as whataboutism. You know, and that is to say, well, you may be criticizing me for Ukraine, but, you know, what about police brutality in the United States? Or, or what about, you know, this or that? And, and again, there's always this effort to suggest that, you know, everybody is bad. So why are you picking on Russia? So th those tend to be Putin's strategies. It hasn't worked terribly well. I mean, if you just look at, um, you know, 
events of the last year, the UN General Assembly has condemned the um, invasion of Ukraine, the annexation of, of, of the four provinces in eastern Ukraine. The UN Human Rights Council has um, created a commission of inquiry, sort of a quasi-criminal investigation of the war crimes in Ukraine. They set up a special rapporteur to look at domestic repression in Russia. And the International Criminal Court is has 40 some investigators in Ukraine building cases against Putin and, and his his commanders. So, you know, Putin is in trouble. But it I just thought it was worth you know highlighting the kinds of things that he is doing to try to undermine human rights scrutiny of, of his repression. Xi Jinping also is trying to undermine the human rights system and a bit more subtly. Um, first, he's trying to redefine what human rights even are. I think many of you know that you know, human rights are, are not something people just made up. They are defined in international treaties. And Xi Jinping would have us ignore those treaties. Um, now, many people tend to say, oh, China wants to promote economic and social rights. They just don't like civil and political rights. And historically, there was some truth to that. But the Xi Jinping actually doesn't want scrutiny under either form of rights. You know, he certainly doesn't want people looking at his civil and political rights because, you know, there aren't any. You know, there, there's no independent judiciary, there's no freedom of expression, no freedom of assembly. Um, you know, people are, as I mentioned, you know, locked up to try to persuade them to, to drop their religion or their culture or what have you. So, you know, there are no civil and political rights in China. But even with respect to economic and social rights, what they require is not um, just rhetoric. They ask, you know, is the government using its available resources to promote as best as it can the welfare of the worst off segments of society? And the last thing Xi Jinping wants you to do is to ask about, you know, how are the Uyghurs doing? How are the Tibetans doing? You know, or even how are the rural Han Chinese doing? These are just not questions he wants asked. So instead of either civil and political rights or economic and social rights, Xi Jinping says, my job is just to build gross domestic product, to expand the economy. And that's it. People are getting richer. Now, that's a complete dumbing down of what human rights are all about. Um, it, it appeals to certain autocrats in the global south to say, oh, yeah, all I have to do is expand the economy and nobody will bother me about human rights. But it, it is not a persuasive concept in international circles. Um, Xi Jinping also wants to change the way that institutions like the UN Human Rights Council operate. Um, it you know, investigates and condemns seriously abusive governments. He wants to have the council only engage in nice, polite conversation with governments about how each in his own way is going to advance human rights. In other words, you, know, you can do what you want in China and just call that human rights and get away with that. Now, these you know, are pretty fundamental attacks. They so far have not been terribly effective. Um, indeed, just um, a few months ago, China narrowly avoided debate at the UN Human Rights Council on Xinjiang, something that has never happened before. Um, it won, but it won by two votes, 19 to 17. Um, and parallel with that, there have been a growing number of governments that just over the last three years has grown from 23 governments to 50 that have been willing to condemn what's happening in, in Xinjiang. And so these, um, you know, time is working against Xi Jinping. The trend is in the direction of being willing to really subject his repression to the scrutiny and the condemnation of the leading UN human rights body. And you can say, oh, you know, who cares? It's just the UN. But, but Xi Jinping desperately cares because, you know, if you say, well, why are you a legitimate leader? He can't say, well, I was freely and fairly elected by my people. Um, he, he you know, asserts that they have made this trade-off that the people of Hong Kong rejected. But what he really values is to be accepted as a legitimate leader by other governments. And, and so he loves you know, going to other governments, being treated as a very respected head of state. But if the UN leading body on human rights condemns him, that's a huge blow to his legitimacy. So he cares very much about this. Now, it's worth noting also that, you know, apart from the UN Human Rights Council's work on China and Russia, which I've mentioned, um, it also does a lot of good work on Myanmar, on Syria, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Venezuela. You know, the, 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 this effort to undermine the UN human rights machinery has not worked. 
But I do want to mention, you know, the, these serious threats coming from the two leading autocratic governments, you know, as they look bad, as their method of governance looks like one that most people don't want, they are trying to strike back by undermining the standards and the institutions that would hold them to account. So that is all what I think is a positive trend amidst this adversity. But um, I don't want to leave you on too complacent a note, because I think we have to recognize that in this global contest between democracy and autocracy, democracy's got some problems too. And what we see in particular is a series of you know, autocratically inclined politicians who are rejecting some of the essence of democracy. You know, and so you have figures who are distrustful of elections, who claim that you know, any election they lose is a, a fake election. You have efforts to undermine checks and balances on executive authority, you know, attacking the independence of judges, um, attacking the media or civil society that might hold um, an abusive leader to account. You have exclusionary appeals, basically anti-rights appeals against vulnerable minorities. They could be LGBT people, they could be asylum seekers, they could be migrants more broadly. But the idea is to you know, pick some vulnerable minority that is not terribly popular among a, a segment of society and use that demonization, use this anti-rights appeal to try to build a kind of a, a sort of a far-right conservative um, following for this autocrat. So we see, you know, while autocracy as leadership is really, I think, in decline, we see more and more autocratic type politicians adopting similar rhetoric, um, similar strategies to try to gain power. Now, one thing I want to conclude on is that there is a, um, you know, rights advocates like to say that if anybody's rights are violated, then all of our rights are in jeopardy. And that's sort of an argument to say, well, okay, even if this group is unpopular, you've got to worry about their rights because otherwise they could come for your rights. And, you know, that has a certain kind of Kantian appeal to it, but the far right doesn't accept it. And the way they don't accept it is they basically just redefine the community because this idea that we, you know, everybody in our community needs to have the rights respected or all of our rights might be in jeopardy. It's an argument that doesn't work terribly well if the community is just defined to not include these other people, to not include the demonized minority. And we're seeing more and more where there just isn't even recognition that certain people you know, should be part of our community. And so as we try to improve our democracy and really defend our democracy, in the face of these kinds of autocratic challenges, you know, aware of this global contest taking place, I think one thing we really have to do is also reaffirm our sense of community because our ability to defend rights really does depend on our ability to treat everybody who lives within our territory as a member of our community. So I will leave you with that as just food for thought and I look forward to your questions and your comments. I'm not hearing anything. Is, is anybody, you're all muted. Jonathan, you're, you're, you're muted. There we go. Can you hear okay. me now? Now I can, yes. Well, thank you. That that was really uh, stimulating and challenging, and um, I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, questions from the audience. Um, but rather than my asking some questions on what you just said, let me ask a few other questions, and then um, we'll turn to the audience and um, come back to some of the issues that you've been so eloquently uh, talking about. Um, so, uh, let me start with um, a question specific one. You mentioned um, Russia and Ukraine. And I think one of the things I've always admired about Human Rights Watch is that it, um, 
is not politically correct. It goes where the issue is. And um, it just issued a report uh, criticizing Ukraine for using any uh, personnel uh, weapons. Uh, so talk to us a little bit of, about that and about uh, you know, everybody in the world, almost. Uh, we're all for Ukraine. But here, Human Rights Watch is coming out and uh, saying almost a war crime. Well, John, I mean, as you know, um, one basic principle that Human Rights Watch follows in any situation of armed conflict is that we always look at the conduct of both sides. You know, we are always neutral about the broader political questions. We never say, oh, you know, you were the aggressor and you were the defender. We don't say, you know, we believe in your political cause more than the other one. Our job is really simply to apply what's known as international humanitarian law or the laws of war to make sure that both sides are doing what they can to spare civilians as much as possible the hazards of conflict. And so, you know, we don't pretend that in the Ukraine war that the two sides are equal. I mean, clearly the Russians are committing war crimes almost as a matter of policy. And the Ukrainians have actually been quite careful in many respects. But we found um, in the fighting around Itzium, you know, one, one important area of fighting in, in the East, that the Ukrainians actually were regularly, not just like once or twice, but regularly um, using anti-personnel landmines. And as you mentioned, Jonathan, in your introduction, you know, Human Rights Watch has been vigorously opposed to anti-personnel landmines for decades now. Uh, we shared the Nobel Peace Prize for helping to secure the, the, the treaty banning landmines. And when our researchers who are in Ukraine found that Ukrainian forces were actually using these landmines, we had to say something. And so, you know, that's just part of what you do if you are going to live up to your principle of looking at the conduct of both sides. That's a, a really important point, and uh, I'm sure there are lots of other illustrations we can talk about as we go along. Uh, yesterday, I gave a, a talk here about the uh, need for uh, an international anti-corruption court. Judge Mark Wolf was with me online. And I'm wondering uh, if you could say some uh, words about the uh, connection between uh, corruption and the violation of human rights. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I should say that I'm a big fan of, of this idea of having an anti-corruption court. I think it, there's a real need for it. And Corruption is, um, I think, both an incentive to violate human rights, and here I mean official corruption you know, by government officials. It's an incentive to violate human rights, but also human rights are um, a key part of the antidote to corruption. It's an incentive in the sense that, you know, if you are a, a government leader and you find that you can get rich by, you know, taking a cut of government contracts or siphoning off funds or what have you, it's a real incentive to stay in power. And, and so we've seen in many countries where the leader just won't step down. The reason is he's making too much money, you know, through the corruption. So there is, you know, it's important if you really believe in alternates of power and, and democratic change to be able to address that corruption. Um, the antidote to corruption, I mean, th this court is an effort to actually prosecute corrupt officials, and that's laudable because. Um, you know, typically, if there are corrupt officials, they've compromised their own judiciary. And so you need an international tribunal as a site where these prosecutions could take place. But within even a national context, the answer to corruption is things like an independent media or a vigorous independent civil society, because these are the people who can do the legwork to figure out, well, where's the money going? Or, you know, how's this official getting so rich? Or, you know, the basic kind of questions that a, a you know, probing journalist or probing activist would ask, but which are not allowed when those basic human rights are suppressed. Another question, uh, what are some of the uh, accomplishments uh, of HRW in your time of which you're most proud? And what are some of the biggest disappointments? Well, um, I mean, in terms of what I'm most proud of, I mean, people, you know, when I'm asked this, Jonathan, you know, people expect me to say, oh, you know, the, the big global treaties. And, you know, yes, it was it was great to get the landmines treaty or the, the treaty banning cluster munitions or getting the International Criminal Court established. That was a very big one. 
But those kind of big global developments are really not what Human Rights Watch spends most of its time doing. You know, most of our time is focused on one country, one issue at a time. And so to cite one, you know, fairly recent example of this work, which I'm very proud of because I think it made a huge difference in many people's lives, involved um, northwestern Syria, the province of Idlib, which is the last part of Syria that is controlled by the armed opposition. And a couple of years ago, there were three to four million civilians in Idlib, and they were being bombed every single day by Syrian and Russian jets. And about half of them were cowering along the Turkish border. Turkey was not letting them in. And their lives were at risk as the Russian bombers in particular were targeting hospitals, you know, schools, marketplaces, apartment buildings. And so Human Rights Watch, you know, did what we did. We, we investigated this, we documented it, we, we wrote about it. Um, we actually even were able to trace the chain of command all the way up to, to Putin and Assad. But the question is, how do you stop it? And so I really um, you know, made this a personal effort. And I spent um, quite a bit of time dealing with various Turkish officials. And ultimately, Turkey played a very important military role in Idlib. But I also went and I met with German Chancellor Angela Merkel and with French President Emmanuel Macron. And I, I said, look, the way to stop this is by you putting personal pressure on Putin. Because at that point, it was pre-Ukraine. Putin still cared about his relations with the most important European powers. And so I said, would you, Merkel and Macron, call Putin? And so they did. They got together. And in February 2020, you know, just as COVID was kind of unfolding, they called Putin and, and said, you got to stop bombing civilians. And about 10 days later in March 2020, March, yeah, March 2020, the bombing stopped. And it has never resumed. And so you now have, you know, three, four million people who are living in Idlib without the constant threat of Russian bombardment. And that's the kind of, you know, very practical, very focused work that is most of what Human Rights Watch does and that I, I get particularly proud of because you just know you're making an immediate difference in people's lives. You know, International Criminal Court is great, but it's a very long-term project um, where these other things can make an immediate difference. That's a great, a great example, uh, really. And um, something that's disappointing, uh, anything else? Oh, well, I mean, look, disappointment. Um, I mean, <laughs> You can't do this work without being disappointed. You know, and I, I suppose what's most disappointing is when people, you know, you really believe in still don't do the right thing. And, and here, you know, I would think about even sort of certain sympathetic U.S. presidents, you know, but when, you know, Obama wouldn't prosecute the Bush torturers or where, you know, Biden is so fixated on, on building an alliance against Russia over Ukraine that he cozies up to the Saudi crown prince. You know, so things like that are, are disappointments. You know, we always expect the bad guys to do the wrong thing. But when people you think are you know, trying to do the right thing still don't, that's particularly disappointing. Um, over your time as uh, head of uh, HRW, local country-based human rights organizations uh, have grown up all over the world. How does Human Rights Watch work with local human rights uh, organizations in Africa and Russia and other places? Well, very closely. And there are groups, I mean, Jonathan, as you know now, in virtually every country. I mean, you know, the most repressive places, say North Korea, you don't have any inside North Korea, but even there you've got people outside that are working on North Korea. Um, so we always work with these local groups and they are, um, are various reasons for that. I mean, one is that they have, you know, I think a special power to move their country. You know, all politics are local and, and governments are particularly attentive to domestic pressure to respect rights. And so we want these local groups to be visible, to be powerful, to be able to push things within their country. Um, but we also, you know, recognize that there are limits to what they can do. You know, sometimes it's not safe for them to speak out 
Um, they certainly don't have the same access that Human Rights Watch does to the international media, um, to you know, international governments or institutions like the UN. And so we will consult with them very closely and say, okay, what do you see as the two or three big issues where Human Rights Watch has value added, where we can work together? And so we will strategize together. We'll often conduct joint investigations. We may do joint press conferences. Um, and it's very much a partnership where each of us brings the value added from our perspective. Oh, well, that's great to hear. And uh, one final question before I open it up. Uh, we have uh, many students here, uh, and I've met many other students here at the College of Charleston who are interested in uh, helping with uh, advanced human rights. Uh, what advice would you uh, give to uh, students who want to uh, be involved in human rights work? Well, let me answer that in two parts, Jonathan. I mean, one is if you actually want to do human rights work, if you want to be, say, you know, a human rights watch researcher, um, the most important thing you can do, particularly, you know, young people like you all are, is get out in the field. You know, use your summers, you know, use a gap year and go live someplace where there are, you know, human rights problems of some sort that interest you that you want to work on. And find some fellowship or find some local job, you know, some way to support yourself and, and just get out in the field, you know, learn the language. Um, language is hugely important. And so, you know, try to master a language other than English, um, but also, you know, try to get familiar with what it takes to operate in, you know, a country outside the West, a country where you, um, things are not easy. But that is, you know, very, very helpful. That's what we look to when we hire staff. Now, for others, for most people who don't want to do this for their life, but just want to know, how can I make a difference? You know, the key to human rights work is shaming governments. You know, what we do is every government pretends that they respect human rights. But in fact, we all know governments fall short. And by spotlighting that discrepancy between the pretense and the reality, we embarrass governments, we stigmatize them, and we all put pressure on them to change. Now, that stigmatization in part takes place through traditional media, but a key avenue these days is social media. And what we know about social media is that people are much more likely to credit, you know, to believe information coming from their friends and acquaintances than they are something coming from just some vague third party. And so, you know, go to the Human Rights Watch website, you know, follow Human Rights Watch on Twitter, follow me on Twitter, um, and then retweet or in your own words, say things that we're talking about. And, and this echo chamber can be remarkably powerful. You may think, oh, you know, who am I? I'm just one person, but this is how we get things done. You know, by spreading the word and by gradually changing the public perception of how a government is behaving, we generate pressure on that government to change. So I really encourage everybody to kind of follow human rights issues and look for opportunities, you know, through social media to spread the word. At first, you're going to feel funny about it. You're going to say, well, you know, why am I talking about this? I, I felt funny the first time I started tweeting. I mean, I totally get this. But you get used to it, you know. And in fact, people very quickly start looking to you as a source of information and analysis. Well, good. Well, that's a, a really good encouragement. Let's uh, now begin to take questions from the audience. And uh, I'm going to ask people to come up and uh, look into the camera so Ken can see your face and uh, tell us uh, who you are and um, then ask your question briefly. So uh, come on up and uh, Joseph, uh, yeah. help me, yeah. Uh, you got to, uh, here's the camera. Here. Okay. Yeah. Hi, yeah. yeah, I can see. I'm uh, Joseph Grobina. I'm uh, one of the global ambassadors under Dr. Kovala. And um, my main interest is North Korea. And I know you mentioned it earlier and it was sort of, um, reminding me when you were talking about autocracies that gain legitimacy by having sort of election farces, how do you plan on dealing, or how does the uh, um, Human Rights Watch approach countries that sort of don't have that entrance into legitimacy or a problem with legitimacy, such as North Korea, that more gains their legitimacy from divine right and approach a country like North Korea that is so volatile? Um, when you start bringing up things like human rights? 
Yeah. No, I mean, you're right. And North Korea is a very challenging situation. You know, it it is probably the most repressive, most closed society in the world. And, you know, Kim Jong-un makes no pretense of having been chosen. You know, there's no pretense of legitimacy other than just kind of this inherited role he has. Um, it's pure, brutal repression that keeps him in power. And so um, our strategy there has been to try to focus on areas where there may be, you know, a bit of an opening, trying to create just a little bit more space for people. So one project that I thought was quite interesting, I actually personally released it in Seoul, was looking at um, the markets, because I guess I'm now best been almost 20 years ago. Um, there was a famine in North Korea. And, you know, many people just stayed home waiting for the government to feed them and they stopped it. But the, um, from that, you know, time of adversity, a series of markets grew up. And these were um, autonomous markets. They gave people a degree of freedom that they hadn't had before. Um, now, the men still had to go to work in factories for earning a pittance, but the women were taken less seriously, so they were allowed to do the market work. And they ended up being the big breadwinners. And, you know, the market work was much more lucrative than these awful government factories. What we looked at was a practice that emerged in these markets where um, police would come in and essentially rape the women. They would just bring them into a back room and rape them. And, you know, because this is North Korea, the women felt they had no recourse. Indeed, you know, one really striking thing is that when we spoke to these women, they didn't even really think of it as rape. They just thought of it as the cost of doing business. I mean, they were just so, you know, accepting of government dominance. So we did a report on this. And it's, you know, it's always hard to know the exact effect of a report in a place like North Korea. But it was an issue we chose because we thought, okay, this, the regime doesn't need to do this to stay in power. This is just, you know, lower level police officials taking advantage of their situation to rape women. This is something that we can stop. And so that's, you know, kind of why we chose that topic, because we thought that even in an awful context as North Korea, this is something that would be, you know, fixable. It's something that we could, you know, convince the government to move on. So that gives you a sense of our, our strategy in a place that is as difficult as North Korea. Another question, come on up. Don't be bashful. Thanks for coming today, um, Ken. I'm Tim Johnson. I'm the dean of the School of Languages, Cultures, and World Affairs. And there's something I've always wondered um, when you address the struggle of democracies in the face of some rising autocracies. When I look at the timeline of this, and you know much more than I do, it seems that in the decline of democracies, the front end of it seems to be a pivotal point around 2008 to 2009 or so. And it just happens that that coincides with the economic um, struggle in the United States and a lot of the defunding of education that had to occur. And what I've always wondered in my mind, if I could comment from you on, is democracy has always been so um, dependent on an educated populace from its very conception. So now we're 15 years past that, and education has still struggled through this for support. How big of a problem is this? And how do we go about as a country um, a democracy trying to correct it in some way um, and in terms of the health of the democracy itself and the citizenry? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. And let me try to answer it in two parts. I mean, on the one hand, I think you're absolutely right to be pinpointing the 2008-2009 economic crisis as a real turning point in the way democracy was perceived. Um, you know, first of all, it was just seen as, you know, a failure of democracy because it was so mismanaged, but it also created a generation, if not more, of people who really just felt left behind. And if you look at, you know, who is turning their back on democracy these days, it tends to be people who feel that they're not being served by the democratically elected government, that they're either not being respected or, or their concerns are being ignored. 
And this, you know, became the heightened problem with the economic stagnation that followed the 2008-2009 economic crisis, because more and more people felt that their lives were going nowhere economically, and they're more willing to contemplate, you know, anti-democratic, more radical um, approaches to government. Now, your point on education, I think, is important because, um, you know, for me, the best antidote to autocracy is an independent thinking, the kind that a good education conveys. You know, an autocrat doesn't want you asking any questions. You know, they want you to just sort of accept what the, the leader tells you to do and trust the leader to know best. And of course, you know, a good um, American university style education doesn't do that. It teaches you how to think for yourself. And so I do think that an educated population in this way that I'm describing, you know, not just being fed propaganda, but really l learning to think for yourself is the key to the health of democracy. Good, next question. People want to get in the queue, they can come and sit here. My name is Gracie Pace. I'm one of the um, global ambassadors at College of Charleston. And my question is, what are the hesitations for international organizations to try Xi Jinping in China um, using claims of genocide? I know that there was maybe an attempt to do that, but I just never understood why they did it. Yeah, the, the, the issue, it's a good question. The issue is really that no court has jurisdiction. So, and, you know, in terms of what Xi Jinping is doing with the Uyghurs, you know, some people say it's genocide. It certainly is crimes against humanity. Either way, it is a crime. So if you had a court, you could prosecute him. But there is no court right now because the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction in only two situations. You know, one is if the crime takes place on the territory of a government that has ratified the court's treaty, which China never did, or if the UN Security Council refers the situation to the court for prosecution, but China would never allow that because it has a veto on the Security Council. So this is the issue. There is no kind of international tribunal. Now, there is one more route that's worth mentioning. Um, and that is the concept of universal jurisdiction. And what that means is that certain crimes like genocide, like crimes against humanity, are so severe that international law allows them to be prosecuted in any competent court around the world. And so theoretically, you know, just as Germany recently prosecuted a Syrian military intelligence officer for the large scale torture of, of detainees, um, a German prosecutor, French prosecutor, could um, charge Xi Jinping. Now, you'd have to get custody of him. It's not easy. You know, um, trials in absentia don't really, they're not a good idea. But the problem is nobody's going to go after China in that way for fear of, you know, it's hard enough to get governments to band together to, you know, condemn China at the UN Human Rights Council. But the idea of like criminally charging Xi Jinping, it's just not something that any government is willing to do today, given the clout of China. I want to take advantage uh, and ask a couple of questions uh, from our yeah. online audience. We have uh, about, about 30 uh, uh, people who were uh, present online, about uh, 25 people here in the audience. Um, one of the questions is about the recommendation uh, on how to best define or defend human rights. And I want to uh, elaborate that, add a little bit of, uh, from, from myself personally. Uh, we know that uh, human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch uh, don't have weapons, they don't have economic power. And then uh, this power of persuasion, uh, the power of shaming and naming and shaming, this is your power really that, that you, you, you can use. Uh, can you talk more about this, these, these tools that are used by human rights organizations uh, in, uh, internationally? And, uh, and, and the second question is about transitional justice, uh, how justice will be served after the war and specifically about the consequences for Russia. And, and the final comment, uh, thank you for starting with human rights as an essential element for democracy. We always overlook democracy as uh, requiring only elections. Yes. Okay, well, I mean, in terms of, you know, I mean, as you suggest, uh, the way human rights groups get things done is, you know, as I said a moment ago, 
by playing on the fact that every government today, as a matter of its legitimacy, needs to pretend to respect human rights. You know, nobody says, oh, we don't care about human rights. They, they just, you know, we're going to do our own thing. They all say that they respect human rights. So even Xi Jinping is trying to redefine what human rights watch, human rights are, but he doesn't ignore human rights. And so, you know, once we have these claims of respect, that gives us power because when we do our careful investigations and we can show that governments are falling short of those claims, that's embarrassing to them. Um, you know, because hum respecting human rights is a key part of their legitimacy, if we can show that they're falling short, it delegitimizes them. Um, and that is the essence of shaming. Every government hates it. You know, people say, oh, shaming, it doesn't work anymore. Totally not true. Every government, including China, hates that spotlighting of their shortfalls on human rights. And so that gives us enormous clout. We have to be careful in our fact-finding. We have to make sure we're accurate. Um, we've got to get it into the media because that's key to um, to shaming the government. But if we do that, we can have considerable power. Now, the other thing that we do, I haven't talked about this yet, is that Human Rights Watch, in addition to having researchers working on about 100 countries around the world, we have what we call our advocates or lobbyists in key capitals around the world. And their job is to go into the European Union or the French government or the Japanese government or you know the Canadian government and obviously to Washington and say, look, this is what we just found in this particular country. These are the problems. You could help us make things better by using your influence. Because every government wants something from the international community. They want arms sales. They want a military aid package. They want some special trade deal. You know, sometimes what they want is just, you know, to be invited to some fancy summit so they can be photographed with respectable leaders and show it to the folks back home to pretend that they're respectable too. You know, so the idea is figure out what does the target government want, and we then try to deprive them of it until they improve their human rights practices. And that's, you know, also a very powerful complement to the to the shaming um, that 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 we do. Um, I'm sorry, you asked about um, oh transitional justice in um, in Russia. The, I mean. I anticipate that the International Criminal Court will, hopefully not too long from now, um, charge Putin and other senior commanders for war crimes. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that they're going to be arrested tomorrow. You know, Putin's sitting there in the Kremlin, he's going to say, who's going to get me? I've got nuclear weapons, you know. So we shouldn't look at it in terms of, you know, are you going to send in, you know, the, the U.S. Marshals to get him or the Marines or whoever. Um, but we have seen situations where highly abusive leaders think that they're safe, you know, that they can be president for life and they can just avoid the need to ever go to trial. But the president for life strategy is a very difficult strategy to sustain and hardly anybody gets away with it. And so just to give you a few examples, um, Slobodan Milosevic, the former leader of Yugoslavia, thought that he would have no problem. He committed all these war crimes in Bosnia. Who cares? He's, you know, president in Serbia. Who's going to turn him over? But there was a power change in Serbia. And the new government wanted to show that it was reformist. It wanted to get sanctions lifted. It wanted to kind of get better economic relations with Europe. The price for that was surrendering Milosevic. And it did. It sent him to The Hague. And he was on trial until he died actually on trial. But he, you know, was very much pursued. Um, and, you know, similar things have happened with Charles Taylor, the former president of, of Liberia, where once he was char charged, it was so delegitimizing, he lost power. He fled to Nigeria, but ultimately he was sent to The Hague and is now serving a life sentence for, for his war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, Hisan Habre, the former leader of Chad, similarly was prosecuted in a, a Senegalese court and convicted. Um, and Omar al-Bashir, the former president of Sudan, thought that he'd be fine. He's sitting in a, a prison cell in Ukraine, in, 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 in Khartoum, um, and they're negotiating for his handover to the International Criminal Court. So, you know, my bottom line is that these, um, you know, presidency of a life strategies are very difficult to sustain for an entire lifetime. And we may not get Putin tomorrow, but if he is charged, it will be very delegitimizing. It will increase his likelihood of people, you know, 
finding a new leader because people are going to recognize that Russia will never get sanctions lifted until they find some way to reconcile with the West. And one key part of that is going to be to hand over the master war criminal. Mike? Blake Scott, I'm an assistant professor here at the College of Charleston. I have a practical professional question for you uh, as a professor, but also for our students. I'm amazed by the, the level of detail that you're able to, to talk about all these issues around the world. And I'm, I'm, asked, I'm curious, and I want to be able to offer this advice to my students as well. What is your routine for keeping up with all these issues? What, what, what is your morning look like into the end of the day? If you, if you could tell, if you could offer some tips or advice on how to process all this. Yeah. Well, you know, I, it's not super secret. I mean, I just, I read a lot. You know, I, I mean, my morning, every morning I go through the papers. I, and I, I mean, I, I may not have an, enough time to go through everything I want to, but I, I try to quickly read through, you know, the international parts of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. Um, and I look at the wires, um, you know, Reuters and, and AP in particular. I look at Al Jazeera. So I just, you know, try to quickly see what's happening. And um, it doesn't take as much time as you would think. You don't, you know, you, you, you know enough. You're just kind of learning the latest developments. But I make a point of, you know, giving myself an hour or so every morning, sometimes a little bit longer to do that. Um, I also, I'm a big fan of Twitter because um, Twitter, you know, once you create your Twitter feed, you're basically curating a news feed for yourself. And you can just kind of do a quick scan through Twitter and see what the latest things are that are going on. So, you know, that's how I do it. And I, you know, I've been doing it long enough that I have a, you know, a base of knowledge. And so as I read things, I'm, you know, adding it to that base and not learning stuff for the first time, but it does take an effort. You know, it, it, I've got to, you know, you have to feel it's important enough to do. And I, I like it. It's not a chore for me. I mean, I enjoy it but it is kind of a key thing to do so that I can stay on top of things. And, you know, because I'm regularly speaking to the media and stuff, I, I sort of need to know what's going on because otherwise, you know, if I miss the latest development, it's embarrassing. So, um, but that's how I do it. Karen, another question. Thank you. I can, I, Karen Morose, um, when uh, John Morose, who I knew rather well in the East West Institute, uh, uh, sessions where he was giving a vast volume of information like this. And as Jonathan has given us, I always used to enjoy when someone would ask him the question, what keeps you awake at night? Or what do you see on the near or distant future that really concerns you? You've shared so much today, but what one or two things, and I'd invite Jonathan too, what worries you? And maybe you're one of these great people that can put their head on the pillow and not think about all of this, but, but what keeps you awake or wakes you up at night with concern over what's ahead? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, in this, I mean, coming back to my opening remarks, um, I mean, even though the world is kind of at the moment very focused on Putin and Ukraine, um, I feel the global response to Putin has been strong. You know, it's not only the military support for Ukraine, but it's also, you know, all these various human rights efforts and prosecutorial efforts that are underway. So I don't feel that Putin is going to emerge from this presenting any kind of fundamental threat to the issues that we're discussing today. China is a very different matter. I feel China is a battle that's very much underway. And because of its economic clout, governments are still reluctant to take it on. I mean, the way we've been able to build this coalition of 50 governments willing to, to condemn China for Xinjiang is by giving them a sense of safety in numbers because they were all afraid to do it individually. I mean, I, to give you a little story, the, the first time we put together one of these coalitions, you know, we said, look, join together. They can't retaliate against all of you. It'll be okay. And so we got 23 governments to sign up. And it was in the context of the UN Human Rights Council. And the tradition is at the council, when there is a joint statement like that, somebody reads it out loud at the council. And nobody would do it. They were all afraid that if you, have, if you just read it, you would be singled out and you would face Beijing's retaliation. So ultimately, the British, you know, caved in and did it. But it shows sort of the fear that still to this day comes from China. And, you know, governments see them as a threat, but they also see them as an economic opportunity. And they're ambivalent. And you see this, you know, with the U.S. government right now, too. 
Um, so that's what worries me, because I do feel that the Chinese government represents a very you know, existential threat to the human rights movement. If its perspective on human rights were to prevail, uh, there'd be very little left of the human rights movement. And that's what they want to do, because that's the key to their legitimacy. So you know, they have the intent, they have the economic means behind them. They're a formidable adversary. And that is, I think, our biggest challenge today. You have another question? Anybody who has not asked a question want to ask one? So we'll take one more question after this, if there is one. Hi, um, Gracie Case again. How does China exactly want to reshape human rights? I was a little unclear on that. Oh, well, they, they, you know, there's because, I mean, as I was saying, you know, because there's no election in China, Xi Jinping can't say, I'm the, you know, freely elected president. Um, they depend very much on being accepted by other governments as a legitimate, well-meaning, decent government. And so if you have, you know, say the UN condemning China for its repression, that's a real blow. It attacks, you know, one of the most important sources of legitimacy for the government. And their answer to that is to try to undermine the UN human rights system, you know, put as many of their people and their allies in key positions, you know, arm twist governments into voting with them, bribing governments. I mean, I think one way to look at the whole Belt and Road Initiative was, you know, not just a trillion dollar infrastructure development program, but a trillion dollar bribe to try to get people on side. I mean, I remember sitting down with um, with, with um, Imran Khan, the former Pakistani prime minister, and he wanted to see me because he wanted to talk about Kashmir. You know, fair enough. Um, and I said, but I'm happy to talk about Kashmir, but why don't we also talk about Xinjiang? Because, you know, it, yes, in Kashmir, the Indian government is persecuting Muslims, but in Xinjiang, the Chinese government is persecuting Muslims. And he basically said, I can't talk about that. You know, China owns me, you know, and he was honest, but that's, you know, the effort that they make to try to prevent governments from, from attacking them and from undermining any possibility of enforcing human rights within China. But it's not enough for that from their perspective just to sort of defend themselves. They're trying to undermine the very system that is capable of holding anybody to account, which is why they hardly ever vote for any human rights initiative, regardless of how bad the situation is. Hey, good afternoon, Ken. This is my name is Brian Rowe, and I am the development officer for the School of Languages, Cultural and Cultural Affairs here at the College of Charleston. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for joining us this afternoon or this evening, as the case may be, where you are. Um, but we, I think we really appreciate it. I think by the, the engagement of everyone here, how much we value your time and, and your engagement with our conversation here today. Um, next week, we have Farwa Amir from the Stimson Center coming to the college to deliver an address relating to water security issues um, around the world. And so my question is, how does the control over resources like water or other natural resources impact um, human rights issues in these autocratic like countries? Well, I mean, let me, if I could, maybe the best way to answer you is to kind of talk a little bit more broadly about the relationship between human rights and the environment. And I mean, obviously with respect to sort of access to water, um, you know, it, that's a classic economic right. You know, if people don't have access to water, it's very hard to have them, you know, for them to have a decent living or to survive. So, you know, one way to look at water is just to say governments have an obligation to ensure that every member of their society, just as they, you know, have a right to have housing and right to have medical care, they need water. You know, so that that's pretty straightforward. One thing we've been doing a lot of work on is is climate change, and the, you know, you might say, well, you know. Why does Human Rights Watch have to get involved in climate change? Aren't there a gazillion environmental groups? And that's true. And so we said, well, we're not going to just be another environmental group. We're going to try to find a way in which um, a human rights approach provides value added. And I'll give you an illustration of how we did this. In the Amazon, there are lots of people who are saying, oh, you know, the Amazon's in trouble. It, it's a carbon sink, but it's disappearing. And um, and so we didn't need to just repeat them, but we found that at the heart of the deforestation in the Amazon were these armed cartels that were violently attacking people who were trying to defend the forest. 
And the people could be indigenous people. They could be, you know, small farmers. Some of them were even, you know, governmental environmental officials, but they were getting killed. And so this is a classic human rights violation. And we were able to investigate and document the problem as a problem of, you know, of violence and, and try to make very concrete the steps that we felt the Brazilian government needed to take to address the Amazon. So it wasn't just some abstract issue, but it was stop killing the people who are trying to defend the forest. And so that was, you know, very powerful within Brazil. We then took it one step further and we said, well, what does Bolsonaro care about? And what he cared about was economic development. And the whole reason he was trying to burn down the Amazon was so that he could have more farmers and ranchers and the like, you know, it was for economic reasons. Um, the other thing that he wanted economically was a trade deal with Europe. Um, Brazil is the biggest country in what's known as Mercosur, which is a trade block in, in South America. And there was a proposed European Union Mercosur trade deal. And we went to the European Union and said, don't sign this deal until Brazil stops burning the Amazon. And we were pushing out an open door. They completely agreed with us. And so suddenly we had this powerful economic pressure on Brazil to stop. Now, you know, Bolsonaro being Bolsonaro, we kind of, you know, pretty much continued to the end. But Lula comes in now and his top priority is defending the Amazon. And he's already asked Europe to revive the Mercosur trade deal. Um, and that may well happen because I think Lula is genuine about trying to stop deforestation. But that gives an example of how, you know, one using the human rights lens is value added. It's different from just the environmental groups. But second, we're able to use the kind of international pressure strategies that we develop in more ordinary human rights cases to positive effect with respect to the Amazon. So Max will uh, close us down in a moment, but Ken, looking back to 87, when you came to Human Rights Watch, looking at the big picture, um, all things considered, uh, are human rights uh, in a better place now than in 87, the same or less good? Yeah, I mean, Jonathan, I mean, as you know, that's a very complicated issue. Um, and I don't think you can answer it globally. Um, there are, you know, parts of the world that are much better. Um, when I started, you know, Eastern Europe was all communist dictatorships. You know, now they're mostly European Union democracies. Latin America was mostly right-wing military dictatorships. Now, again, they're mostly democracies. Um, you know, South Africa was apartheid. You know, now much of Africa is, is again, you know, reasonably right-respecting and democratic. And you could say the same thing about you know, East and Southeast Asia. So those are the positive things. But then, you know, the negative things you have, um, I think the Middle East is pretty much stagnated. Um, China and Russia, you know, got better for a while. Now they're worse. And so I think for me, the bottom line is um, it's really always a struggle. You know, governments are always tempted to violate human rights. And the job of the human rights movement is to push back, to increase the cost of that cost-benefit analysis that leads to repression. And where I do feel that things are better than in 87 is there's a stronger movement today. You know, back then, governments could hide what they were doing. Nobody can hide anymore. You know, there, there are not only are there human rights activists every place, but there are, you know, smartphones every place. I mean, people can kind of, you know, pick up their phone and, and you know, do a video or a photograph and put it on social media and, and the world knows. So um, it is easier to defend human rights, but it's still a struggle and it's always going to be a struggle. That's just what it is. You know, you don't go into this business to kind of fix it. You go into the business to try to, you know, gradually improve things, but recognize that it's, it's always going to be a battle. Well, we're grateful that you've uh, led the human rights movement for three decades and a uh, much more powerful movement than it was three decades ago. And I gather now you're going to write the story. Uh, I'm writing, uh, yes. yes. And that's going to be uh, something we're all going to want to read. And I hope sometime uh, you'll come and visit the College of Charleston. Uh, I love it here. Uh, I really uh, admire the School of Languages, Cultures, and uh, World Affairs, uh, and the Moreau's Leadership Institute. This is just a fabulous place, smart, wonderful, engaged, well-motivated people. Not the least I would look forward to that. Is Max. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much, Ken. Thank you so much for your remarks, for, for this discussion. Very, very thought-provoking, very insightful conversation, and uh, we learned a lot. 
We really appreciate your time. And thank you, Jonathan, for making this visit possible. Uh, and thank you for coming uh, to, to see us here. And Ken, I, I cannot agree with Jonathan's endorsement more. Uh, we, we would love to have you here at the College of Charleston at some point in the future. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Now, yeah, so I, I also want to thank uh, everyone for, who attended this uh, discussion, the seminar, uh, remotely or in person. Next Monday on February 6, we're hosting Faro Amr. She will. Uh, she's a, a research analyst from the Stimson Center in Washington D.C., and she will have a discussion on the, on an important intersection of water security and gender and the role, the important role done by women groups uh, around the world uh, to guarantee that right. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and have a good night.